Hi everyone, welcome to Battery Bulletin. Today we are going to dive into Tesla's new patent published on 9th of July 2020. The patent was developed by Tesla Canada research team from Dalhousie University, Jeff Don's lab. The title of patent is Electrolytes with Lithium Difluorooxalate Borate and Lithium Tetrafluoroborate Salts for Lithium Metal and Anode-Free Cells. Let's have a look how important this patent in developing better batteries for future Tesla's electric fleet. As you can see from the title surprisingly this is not related to lithium-ion batteries, but lithium metal batteries. Jeff Don and his team is working on lithium metal batteries for few years now. The concept of anode-free lithium metal batteries was introduced in year 2000, this was a thin film battery with few microamp hours capacity, but anode-free cells became popular with this publication in 2016, which uses a low-voltage LFP cathode with excess electrolyte in coin cell format with 2 mAh capacity and electrolyte to capacity ratio of 75 grams per amp hour. Tesla's patent is important because it uses a single crystal NMC high-voltage cathode in pouch cell format with lean electrolyte 2 grams per amp hour and a capacity of 250 mAh cells that is 37 times less electrolyte and 125 times more capacity than the 2016 report which means this is a realistic prototype cell. First, let's have a look what is the main difference of a lithium ion, lithium metal in an anode-free cell. For now, let's look at the differences in the cathode and the anode. In lithium ion cells we have a lithium-rich cathode and a graphite anode. When you charge the battery, lithium ions travel through the electrolyte from cathode to the anode and the electrons travels through the external circuit. Once we started using the device, discharge process takes place and the opposite reaction happens. The length scale in this diagram represents a proportional thickness of the actual cell components, except the additional space for electrolyte, which is just for the sake of clarity of visual presentation. This is an actual lithium-ion battery cross-section, which was done using a technique called X-ray nano-computed tomography. As you can see there is no gap between the electrodes and the separator. The microstructure of the anode and cathode are different, and there are pores in the electrodes and the separator to soak up the electrolyte. The graphite is the thickest component than the cathode and finally the separators and current collectors. There are different types of lithium metal cells, in this particular lithium metal cell, we simply substitute the graphite anode with a lithium metal anode. Unlike graphite, lithium is more reactive, and it consumes in each and every cycle. So we need extra lithium in order to get a similar cycle life like in lithium ion batteries. Let's say we can achieve this by having 2.5 times excess lithium. Theoretically lithium metal has 10 times the capacity than graphite, however, due to practical limitations, we can increase the gravimetric energy density somewhere from 25% to 50% for this particular lithium metal cell configuration. Then what are anode-free lithium metal batteries? Do they actually doesn't have an anode? Well, the term anode-free actually comes from the cell assembly point of view. These are lithium metal batteries. In these cells, instead of the anode you have only the anode current collector, and the rest of the cell is the same during the cell assembly. Once you charge for the first time it will deposit lithium ions in the metal form on the anode current collector. However, because we don't have extra lithium unlike in lithium metal batteries, they consume lithium ions quickly, and leads to a poor cycle life. But compared to lithium-ion batteries, the gravimetric energy density can increase from 30% to 60%. What are the advantages of anode-free cells over lithium metal batteries? At the moment it is really costly to make thin lithium foils which is around 20 to 50 microns. Lithium metal is so reactive that if you have just a tiny bit of air or moisture when you are assembling them, it could compromise the operation of the cells, therefore you need really strict control environments. Anode-free cells doesn't require a lithium metal therefore it can avoid these costs. Lithium metal undergoes significant expansion and contraction upon cycling, so you need to allow some free space which makes cylindrical cells not the best option, because that are wounded under high tension. So you would mostly see prismatic, or pouch cells for lithium metal batteries, and they usually compromise 20% volumetric energy density, but it will still have a significant improvement over lithium-ion batteries. In a previous study from Jeff Dunn's group, they did a basic calculation to evaluate the theoretical volumetric energy density on stack level, using both side-coated foils for lithium-ion battery, it was 725 watt-hours per liter, and for a node-free cell after first the lithium deposition, it was 1220 watt-hours per liter, which is about 70% increase in volumetric energy density. 
Volumetric energy density is more important for portable electronics and electric vehicles because you only have limited space to fit the battery. Keep in mind since the anode-free cell has lithium metal upon charging and because it expands, practically this value will be lower than this value. I did a basic calculation based on the values they mentioned, additionally I added 2 grams per amp hour electrolyte to get an idea of the gravimetric energy density for lithium ion battery cell, it was 248 watt hours per kilogram, and for the anode free cell, it is 327 watt hours per kilogram, which is 32% increase in gravimetric energy density. A lighter battery can increase the driving range. There are a lot more parameters that you need to take into account when calculating the energy density, we will discuss those in the future. The electrolytes that works well with graphite doesn't work well with lithium metal. This plot shows screening of some of the potential candidates based on previous research. LiPF6 is a popular salt that we use in lithium ion batteries. LiPF6 has a high solubility, high ionic conductivity and thermal stability. The choice of solvent mixture FEC and DEC in this study is different from what we normally use in lithium-ion batteries. You can see from the squares that LiPF6 resulted the worst performance, only 20 cycles. Diamonds, which is LiBF4 did 40 cycles. 0.6 M lithium DFOB did 80 cycles, and 1.2 M lithium DFOB did 100 cycles, with 55% capacity retention. A mixture of 0.6 M lithium DFOB and 0.6 M LiBF4, from now on which we will refer as dual salt mixture, also did a good job. Then they check how does the best performing salt candidates works when you increase the upper cutoff voltage. When you reach high voltages it actually perform better. As you can see lithium DFOB alone performs better than the mixture of the salts. But they went with the dual salt mixture for further studies. Why is that? The answer for that question is in this Nature Energy paper from the same team. At high voltages the electrolyte reacts and form gases. DFOB alone at 4.5 volts results in huge amount of gas which could explode if the cell is under pressure. The mixture on the other hand even though it generates some gas, it actually consumes them with cycling after 400 hours, which makes it better, and by the end of cycling results less gas. This is why they choose the dual salt mixture for further studies. Now that the salt is set, they wanted to check what is the best solvent mixture. Keep in mind these solvents were chosen based on literature and their experience. Jeff's group is famous for additive studies for lithium-ion batteries, so they have lot of experience with electrolytes. Without changing much they found FECDEC is actually better. Then you need to optimize ratios of the solvents. However, they found the solvent ratios didn't affect much in term of cycling performance. Next, for the sake of clarity they tried a popular electrolyte that used in lithium-ion batteries and compared that solvent in the anode-free cell. This shows why we cannot use the same electrolytes for lithium metal batteries. Unlike graphite, which acts as a host when lithium ions intercalated expands around 10%, lithium metal can expand and contract upon deposition and dissolution of lithium ions infinitely. When it deposit lithium it should deposit uniform and homogeneously, but due to many reasons this doesn't happen the way we want, instead it deposits as small nodules, filaments and various other ways. During discharge lithium metal should dissolve uniformly, but this doesn't happen either. Sometimes it dissolves more from one place and leads to pits, and even break off some of the lithium particles. Once these lithium particles break off, they immediately react with the electrolyte and becomes electrochemically inactive. These disconnected particles from the electrode cannot maintain an electronic pathway. We call them dead lithium. This is why we need extra lithium supply in lithium metal batteries. Let's have a look how the pressure play a role in these batteries. The external pressure somewhat helps to keep the lithium intact and grow and dissolve better. Look at this data, this is an example showing how the internal pressure changes with cycling for lithium metal, graphite, and a silicon graphite composite. Let's consider the contribution to pressure change from the cathode is the same for our convenience. The average pressure change when you have graphite is negligible, it doesn't change throughout cycling. For silicon graphite composite the pressure increases by 60%. For lithium metal this is roughly 75%. Keep in mind the external pressure applied for lithium metal cell is roughly 6 times higher than the pressure applied for the graphite cell. With cycling lithium or silicon becomes more porous and increases the thickness. This increases the pressure inside the cell. I hope now you have an idea on how important the pressure for lithium metal cells. From this slide you can see, 
that even the worse electrolyte performance somewhat improves under pressure, which means it helps to suppress dead lithium formation to some extent and keep the lithium in contact with the current collector. For the dual salt it only helps a bit. This means the electrolyte fundamentally helps to deposit and dissolve the lithium better. Now let's have a look why actually this electrolyte blend makes the lithium deposit better. In lithium ion batteries or lithium metal batteries during the first charge, the electrolyte and the anode reacts and form a protective layer called solid electrolyte interface or in short SEI. The thickness of the SEI usually varies from 10 to 100 nanometers range and comprised with different small organic and inorganic molecules. Some researchers have come across this mosaic model where organic and inorganic molecules exist in a single layer, whereas others have discovered inorganic and organic molecules rich separate layers. The SEI allows ions to move across freely, but not for electrons. Because of this protective layer it will avoid further consuming the electrolyte, which is why we can use lithium ion batteries in long term. But unfortunately, in lithium metal batteries, we are still working on to find that best SEI layer. It makes the job harder because unlike lithium ion batteries, if the deposit is not uniform due to huge volume changes, the SEI can rupture and expose fresh lithium surface and reacts further. This consumes more lithium, and one of the reasons why we need extra lithium in order to operate these batteries in long term. If your SEI is stretchable and allows ions to go through back and forth without tearing apart, you will have a homogeneous much more stable lithium deposit. These are some spectrums from an experiment technique called X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, which gives us information what kind of species that you can expect on your surface in few nanometers. This is actually a really good tool to study the SEI. With respect to reference samples you can identify what kind of species exist in your SEI. In lithium metal battery space lithium fluoride is known as a good SEI former. However in this case, the fluorine spectra shows that even though LIPF6 generated a lithium fluoride rich surface, that didn't work well. When you add DFOB it actually increases the organofluorine content. When you add LIBF4 this increases more inorganic lithium fluoride. The carbon spectra confirms the increase in organic species with DFOB, which tells us that a good SEI maybe needs to have both organic and inorganic rich components to work well for lithium metal batteries because those cells worked well under such conditions. Then they tracked how the electrolyte is consumed with cycling. This was done by nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy technique. The LIPF6 concentration actually didn't change, but the cells failed rapidly. So they conclude that these cells failed because of excessive dead lithium formation. When you have DFOB alone it actually consumes the salt and the concentration drops drastically and it produces LIBF4 in low concentrations as a byproduct. When you have a dual salt mixture it reduces the rate of salt consumption as now both salts are been consumed. This tells us that the SEI is still not good enough that it breaks and repairs with cycling and it consumes these salts when it's repairing. Someone might think, why can't we add more salt and operate the battery for long term? Adding more salts will make your electrolytes viscous and slow down the movement of ions. The other challenge is the cost. These are the SEM images of lithium metal after first deposition and after 50 cycles. The scale is 10 micron. Look at the lithium deposits when you have LIPF6. They look like nodules. Under high pressure they becomes flat. Which means they won't break off easily but the particle size are still small. After 10 cycles the surface area is really high, which means it can accelerate the reaction with the electrolyte and can easily break off producing dead lithium. With the dual salt mixture the particles are already flat at low pressure, which means they grow uniformly with a low surface area because of its good SEI properties. After 50 cycles the particles become even bigger. It might have reduced the grain boundaries, but the surface area increases gradually as well. Remember, these tests were done at 40 degrees Celsius. This is a paper which shows what happens to the lithium metal with increasing temperature. Compared to room temperature, at high temperatures lithium becomes soft and the lithium ions can move more freely. So with time, the lithium ions on the surface move slowly and fuse together, lowering the surface area even more. This could be why the lithium particles became larger with cycling. Now let's have a look how they look like and when you disassembled the cells. A and C are after the first charge, and B and D are after 50 cycles. If you have a good lithium deposit usually it is shiny. After the first charge you can see shiny areas and dark areas. The regions that are dark have a high surface area, and it could be either active or dead lithium. 
The small irregularities on the surface of copper foils can also result these differences in lithium deposition due to uneven pressure distribution inside the cell. The lithium deposits also grow more on hotspots. After 50 cycles the deposit becomes even darker, clearly indicating the buildup of dead lithium with cycling and increase in surface area. This pretty much summarizes the patent, but now I want to show you few more important details about this project. This research paper from the same team shows that they actually have 15% excess lithium by limiting the discharge voltage at 3.6 volts, and all the lithium is recoverable only if you discharge below 1.5 volts. The next point I want to make is that this was done at 40 degrees Celsius. Organic solvents are vulnerable at higher temperatures. They can decompose and consume much faster. Did they try to cycle these cells at room temperature? The answer is yes. You can see that the cells fail quickly without excess pressure at 20 degrees Celsius, but when you apply external pressure, they retain 65% capacity retention after 100 cycles. So what is the strategy they use to improve room temperature cycling without applying too much pressure? Let's talk about that in the next video. So what does this patent means to Tesla? It's a good sign that Tesla is investing money on R&D for beyond lithium-ion battery technologies. The current increase in energy density for lithium-ion batteries is annually 5%, and most of that actually comes from engineering point of view, not directly from battery chemistry. In a few years we might actually reach the maximum practical energy density in lithium-ion batteries, which means we definitely need to look at other battery chemistries. So this is actually good news. The next question is do I see anode-free cells in the real world anytime soon? Most likely not during next 5 to 10 years. One of the measurements that we determine how good a battery works depends on a measurement known as columbic efficiency, which is simply the ratio of electric charge introduced to the cell during charging and the electric charge extracted from the cell during discharge. The columbic efficiency for this study was 99.75% after 90 cycles for 80% capacity retention. For electric vehicles in order to have a lifetime of 1 million miles, roughly it would take 1,000 full cycles, assuming a driving range of 1,000 kilometers for lithium metal batteries, which is twice the range with lithium-ion batteries. This would need 99.97% columbic efficiency. You might think how hard it is improve 0.22% trust me it's really difficult. However, there are thousands of scientists working at this very moment to reach that goal. Thanks for watching and please give a thumbs up if you like this video, and if you are interested for more videos on batteries subscribe to my channel. If you would like to support this channel, become a Patreon at the link at the end of the video, or using the link on the description of the video. Let's discuss about the video in the comments below, and let me know what I should improve. Stay safe and see you soon on Battery Bulletin.